No, I'm not preaching the word of man. I'm just introducing the one who will. <laughs> Every once in a while in life, you uh, you meet a person, and as soon as you meet them, you realize this is a man of quality. This is a man of integrity. And uh, as you get to know them, you realize that this is one of those rare men. And Benny is one of those rare men. Uh, we met back in about 2005 when I was going over there to become the director of the school in Athens, and I knew right off the bat that this is someone special. He had graduated from the school over there prior to me going over there. I think you were in the first graduating class, and he got real, he was, when I got over there, he was real busy working with the church over there and, and very involved, and, and we were talking about we need to get him teaching in the school, so we soon got him teaching one class in the school for a little while, and next thing you know, he's teaching two classes, and and uh, I was impressed with what I saw. He was just a very, he's very intelligent, very smart. And, and I said, this is the man. I started thinking early on, says, when I leave, this will be the man I'll take over. So when that time came and we started thinking who's next, uh, he became the director of school back in 2000 and, in, well, end of 2010, started 2011. And he's taken the school to new heights over there, done a wonderful job. Uh, Benny is from Albania. Him and his wife, Sunila. Sunila, his wife is here with us today. Stand up and let everybody see you real quick. As always, she's the strength of the family. He's got two children. Benny's got two children that uh, are in Linscombe or just graduated from Linscombe. And so uh, uh, he's here to speak a little bit about what's going on over in Athens. So, Benny, come and preach the word. Well, thank you, Ron. I hope from what you said, only half are true. So, Well, greetings. I bring greetings from the school in Athens. I bring greetings from the church in Athens. Greetings to you all. So it's uh, wonderful to be here, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to share the word of God with you this morning. And when Brother Ron told me this last Sunday that I'm going to talk in this chapel, a topic of my choice, and by the way, he, he said that I can teach as long as I want. <laughs> and don't forget that from the place I come, we teach till people keep falling from the windows. So <laughs> stay away from windows and listen to me. So when he told me that I'm going to talk in the chapel, the topic of my choice, I was going through what I call the preacher sermon choice temptation. We all have it, and we usually when the topic is not determined by the congregation that you are preaching, then you are tempted what to preach. And you're looking for in your records of your sermons, you look for, you know, great, moving sermons, intellectually, wonderful, so you will be impressive. Or you want to take a simple sermon and just deliver well, I believe that the same dilemmas was Apostle Paul going when he went to Corinth. And this is in Corinth. He will tell them in his letter that uh, he decided, it says, to preach the gospel not with wisdom. I, just, I, I see it there. Okay. Uh, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. And in uh, two one he says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, Declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Again, into four, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of spirit and power, that your faith should not be in wisdom of man, but in the power of God. And don't forget, these are the words of Paul, a very able man. He is a man of understanding. A theologian raised in the feet of Galileo, eloquent, persuasive speaker, and he decided to speak the simple message of cross. So, deciding I wanted to share a simple verse today with you, and as you'll see, my verses will be in English and in Greek, not just to, sh not to show that I know Greek, no, no, no. It's just if you have a different translation, let's see the original, what it says. I have New King James here, and sometimes people come and say, oh, I use this. And we can, you can use whatever you want, so I'll just check the Greek down. So, 
2.13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. This is the verse that we'll see together. Sometime in our arrogance, even the progress of our Christian life, we dedicate it to ourselves. Probably everybody in this room knows this verse. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And this is the verse before 13. And 13 shows you how to work out your own salvation. And we make sermons out of it and we find ways how to work out. But 13 tells, let God work in you. And this is how you work out your salvation. We tend to divide salvation in two parts. Till we go to the baptism, everything is grace, the work of God. I cannot do anything about it. After the baptism, we believe that now it's my time to do my work. But, and we'll take verses like this one, Ephesians 2, 2 8. Look at the uh, time of the verb. It says, For by grace you have been saved, it's a past tense, through faith and not ourselves. Or uh, Titus 3 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Again, it's a past tense. And we see this a past tense oh, till the time that we go to the baptism, and then my work starts. My part starts. God does this part, I do this part. Actually, if you see verses like Hebrew 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher. If you see this uh, teleotin in Greek, for the finisher is the perfecter. He makes everything perfect in my faith. When? From the beginning to the end. Then we'll go and make the question, if, we're living, if living a Christian life and pleasing God is not by work, then how it is done? Who is doing it? Is God forcing me, miraculous, to do things that I don't want to do? So let's go and see the verse. It starts with, it is God who works in you both to will. So we'll see first the will. What to understand the will? It's my desire, my plans. So how can God works my can work through my will? First, you need to know that it is simple. Let his will shape your will. Let his purpose shape your purpose. And let his plan shape your plans. This is how he works. Again, the question is, how it is done? Let's see some verses together. First, we start by renewing your mind. And we just read uh, Romans 12. We'll see verse 2. It says, and do not be confirmed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I'm not going to you know, discuss about this systematism, metamorphosis. We have heard this thousands of times. I want to see this word. Renewing. Anakinis in Greek. Still used in modern times in Greek. What is you know, the, the word structure is very simple. Ana again, kenos new. Make new again. But if you ask a Greek today, what's this renewing thing? And let's suppose that we want to renew this room. In our mind, it's just uh, this line of the chairs, put it there, paint it, and this is renewing. Not in Greek. In Greek, everything that is inside here goes out, and everything that comes in is new. And this is what God is telling me. We all come with a you know, system of beliefs inside us. Uh, I was raised in Albania during a communist regime, and if you asked me before becoming a Christian of who is the greatest nation, probably you, you knew the answer, Albania. 
you ask somebody from states who is the greatest nation, say, U.S. Those are the system of beliefs were built on us through repetition from the time that we were little. And we accept it without any discussion. Our mind accepted as truth. So what is telling me? Actually, he's telling me, take your system of beliefs that you built in the world, take everything out, and put inside the things of God. But I have a problem with my mind. My mind is not a, cup, uh, a glass of water. So you have dirt water, and you just throw it away, and you put some fresh water, clean water, and you're done. This is not my mind. In order for my mind to take out the dirt of the world, I need to keep pouring fresh water from God inside. And this will make the circulation. This will make the renewing. So he says, without renewing, without filling your mind with things from God, we cannot even distinguish the will of God. Sometimes we try with worldly measures to have biblical results. It doesn't work. Biblical measures will give you biblical results. Secondly, do not trust your understanding, but obey his will. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, and lean not on your understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Unfortunately, in our time, that we believe that we know everything because we have a smartphone in our hands and we can Google everything. It's so easy to get caught in the idea that it doesn't make sense for me. It's not right. And God says, do not lean in your understanding. Maybe, probably it doesn't make sense to you, but this is my will. Don't ever take decisions according to your own understanding, but obey in the will of God. Even if it's strange for you sometimes, even if you know that you'll not have the result that you are expecting if you do it, lean not on your understanding. Third, learn to concentrate your mind on the good things. Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Do not concentrate in the negatives. Look at this, whatever, whatever, if, whatever, if. What does this mean? This means what, when I start thinking about Sonila, do not concentrate in the negatives. Try to find positives. What is positive comes from God. What is negative comes from whom? So try to find the positive, what is coming from God. And these are the things that you meditate. When you think of your brother, what do you think first, the negative or the positive? When you think of your co-worker, what do you think first, negatives or positives? And he says, think first the positives. Concentrate in the positive. Think of a person who that you put no value at all. You, you have all the negatives about him. Do you think that there is nothing positive? There's always something inside that God put there. So concentrate in the positive. People, situations, try to find the noble things and meditate on this. Control your mind. You built in negativity, you are a negative person. You built in positivity, you are a positive person. And it's not only for Christianity, it's for everyone. Learn to discipline your mind to obey Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, 
and every high thinker that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Let's see a little bit this verse. We need to understand first that we are not dealing with just a problem here. He's talking about warfare. And it's easy for me to understand, oh, this is the war of me, who I'm a good guy with others who are the bad guys. No, 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 no. This war is not out of me. This war is in me. And he's talking about these thoughts that are coming from me that are not disobeying the will of God. Plans for the, my future. Relationship with people. They are not obeying the will of the king. When you serve in a mission field, and probably most of you who are teaching here have served in mission fields. I call the mission field the first line of the war with the devil. Not because he'll come around you and make it difficult for you to rent an apartment. No, 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 this is nothing. Or persecution from outside. Again, you can handle this. The biggest problem comes from inside. It's fighting yourself to understand that it is not your church. It is his church. It is fighting yourself to understand that you are not the emperor of this little empire. You are just the servant of the king there. And these little thoughts that will start from my ego will come to me. And what the verse is telling me? Take this thought and show it to Christ. Is it a being Christ? Then let it go. Let it become an action. If it's not obeying Christ, what it says? Take it to captivity. When you take an enemy to captivity, what do we do to them? We don't kill, we don't torture them. What do you do? You remove from them the ability to fight. And this is what you do with these thoughts. You remove the ability to become actions. Control your mind. Discipline your mind. If it's not with Christ, it's against Christ. To captivity. Yeah, but makes sense to me. No, no, it's not from Christ. Captivity. Let's see the next part. So we saw the will. My will should be shaped by the will of God. My purpose should be shaped by his purpose. My plans should be shaped by his plans. If it's not there, forget about it. This is how he works in me to will. The second part talks about actions. To do. This is all what a person is. To will and to do. And he says that it is God who works in you. You see, in uh, verse 13, the Greek is energon. God is working. And to do for me is energin. Again, for me. So it's the same word used. In work. God is in work. And I am in work because of him. How it is done? How can God direct my actions? Am I, am I just a puppet in strings that God is doing things with my hands? No. I dedicate everything I do unto his glory. In uh, Colossians 2, it says, uh, 3 2, it says, Set your mind on things above, not on things on earth. And 3 5 says, Therefore put to death your members which are on earth. Now, what does it mean to put to death? Have you ever been next to a 
dead person. What will happen if you shout really loud to them? Nothing. Nothing. What if you shake them well? You kick them? Nothing. Nothing. Why? There is no action. They are dead. This is what I say about my members. If they are acting according to the word, put it to death. No action. Zero. Zero. John 14.21, he who has my command and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And then John 14.15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, I do this all the time with my, uh, with our church members and my students. I say, well, do you love Jesus? Let me say hands. Everybody, hey, love Jesus. Do you obey him totally? You know, the hands start going down. Why? Because we, we connect loving Jesus with healing rather more than with the total obedience. But he says, he who loves me keeps my commandments. Do what he says. In, in, in 14.21, he, he who has my commandments, you should know them first and then keep them. And this is what you are doing here, studying to know the commandments of Christ. Accept the true lordship of Jesus in our life. Matthew 7, 21 says, oh. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But who? He who does the action, the will of the Father. Calling Jesus Lord is not enough. Acting as he is the Lord, this is what he is asking for. This is something that we all fail when it comes to lordship. And this is from the beginning, the, the, the problem. If you go and do this in your studies for some time, uh, if you see the first chapter of uh, Genesis going till uh, chapter 2 and verse 7, you'll see that during the creation, God is called Elohim all the time. And God said, and God did, and God said, and God, and God, and God. When it comes to man, there is another word added to this. It is not more Elohim only. It is Lord God. When man is created, it is not just God the creator. He is Lord God. Do this and see this in your studies. When you go in chapter 3 and see Satan approaching Eve, he says, did God say, where is the word Lord? So from the beginning, this was a scene, removing the lordship of God from me. And he says, not everyone who calls me Lord will enter heaven, but he who does the will. Obey God because his commandments are not burdensome. If you want to obey God and go every where around you say, oh, I'm tired and I'm doing so much. Better don't do it. God says, my commandments are not burdensome. We are privileged to serve the king. If we see it as burdensome, forget he will not count it. Remember in, the, in Matthew 7, 20, uh, we just read, but if you continue 21, 22, he'll say that many will come at this day and tell to, and say to me, Lord, Lord, in your main, name did I do this? Prophesy, did I do this? Cast out demons, did I do this? Many powerful miracles. And the question is, what is it? Anything sinful from what he said? No. They did not accept the Lordship of Jesus in their life. Closing. I'll read again from what we started with. It is God who works in you, both to do and to will. From the beginning to the end is God's work. God bless you all.